Welcome to our service uh, here today. My name is Peter Evans, minister here at Stanthal Presbyterian Church. Uh, now, I couldn't help myself, but I've arranged uh, some of my own sort of military uh, memorabilia. These are units that I've served with over the years, uh, serving in the Armour Reserve. Uh, I've, I've done that because, of course, this is uh, April, Sunday, April 26th. It's the weekend in which we celebrate Anzac Day. Um, for Anzac Day morning on Saturday, my, my family got up. We stood in our driveway with quite a few others, I think, uh, to listen to the last post and Ravelli. It was blasted out from speakers in the main, uh, the main street here in Stanthorpe. So it was really, it was really great to get up and, and, and hear that. So I thought, look, to open our service today, I might read the Ode and then open it with a prayer particularly aimed at those men and women who, um, both, both past and present, who have served in our defence forces. Let me read the Ode before, and then, then I'll pray. Now they shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. The going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them lest we forget. Let me pray. Father God, we want to um, stop this, to this, this day, um, this Anzac weekend, and to give you thanks for all those men and women who have served, both past and present, in our Defence Forces. We thank you for the way in which they have trained so hard, the way in which uh, many of them have been prepared to go and put themselves in harm way for us. We particularly want to pray for those who have lost their lives, whether that be in the world wars or conflicts since then. We want to thank you for the way in which they were prepared uh, to give up their own lives for the sake of our freedom, for the sake of our prosperity as a country. We particularly think at this time of our families. Um, there will be families this day whose loved ones are serving overseas, uh, worried and anxious about their safety. And there will be families this day who will be grieving the loss, the loss of, of loved ones who have lost their lives even in the service of their country. Father God, in their grief and, and loss, may it be that they might find comfort through the Holy Spirit in your name. Father, on this day, we cannot help but think about the ultimate sacrifice that, that had been paid by many soldiers over, over the years. And may that remind us of the ultimate sacrifice that Christ paid for us on the cross. The freedom that our, 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 um, our soldiers buy for us is often only for a time. But through Christ Jesus, he, through his death, he offers us freedom from sin that will last for eternity. So it may, may it be on this Anzac Day weekend, we would think of what it means to lay down our lives for a cause. And we think about the cross and what Christ did, laying down his life there to give us, grant us, and win for us a freedom that might last forever. That might lead to us being able to spend eternity with him in heaven. In Jesus' name. Our uh, opening song this morning is called a book called uh, sorry a book a, a song called You Alone. It's a it's a new song by Trevor Hodge that we're actually using as a bit of a theme song uh, as we start a new preaching series this term in Daniel. Uh, let me hand over to Kate. Hey everyone, uh, we're going to sing a new song this morning. It's called You Alone by Trevor Hodge. Uh, we've chosen this as a theme song, Katie, is that right? Yes. And um, it's a theme song for this whole book of Daniel because it kind of goes from creation right to the end of time, reminding us uh, that Jesus alone is the one that we can go to to be rescued. A couple of key lines in here to talk about that. Uh, for people that are downtrodden, for people that feel so alone and broken, and at a time like this in the middle of COVID where we feel so isolated, uh, this could be a great theme song for us as we pick up things from Daniel about how God's people um, uh, cope, reminding he is the only way to salvation. So you alone by Trevor Hodge. Thanks, Katie. Thank you.
Thanks, Katie. Um, let's spend some time in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we, we want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather and, and worship you this day. We want to thank you that you are the God who is not like stands from afar and, and looks down uh, upon your earth, but Father, you are, have been intimately involved in human history. We want to thank you for the ultimate way in which you have, you have joined us in some ways um, by sending your own son to take on flesh and walk amongst us. And so we might look at Jesus, his character, his personality, at who he is, and through him see what you are like. And so, Father, as we, um, as we gather to worship you today, we want to thank you for the way in which you have you call us out of darkness into light. So often we have fallen short of your standards, fallen short of your law, but through grace you have called us to be a part of your family through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We want to thank you for the way in which you are at work in our lives. We want to thank you for the way in which we can follow you each and every day of our life. May, may every, every day be a fresh opportunity for us to worship you and to offer our, our lives to you as a living sacrifice. In Jesus' name. Uh, okay, so um, uh, let, we've got a few announcements for you this morning. Um, there's lots of different things sort of happening despite being in isolation uh, and despite being stuck at home for uh, most of the day. Uh, the first one is this, I've already explained this morning, we are starting a new preaching series uh, today in the book of Daniel, so we've got nine weeks doing that. Um, this is uh, something a bit special actually for to, this preaching series, I got together with two other ministers in the Southern Downs with uh, David Bailey at Rose City Presbyterian Church at Warwick and Brad Jewson at, at Gundy Presbyterian Church. We got together well, back, no, back in last November actually to to, to plan this series together. We read the book and divided it up and thought of what it's about. Um, and um, and what will actually be happening is, given the circumstances with COVID-19, uh, each of us have prepared three of the, the sermons in the series. Um, we will be recording our sermons and we'll be preaching uh, one of us to each, uh, all three of the congregations that, that are, are involved. Uh, now, we have also produced a Bible study booklet to go with the preaching series. Um, here it is here. Um, so I recommend that you uh, we've got, we've got copies of that. I'll be promulgating or you know, sending out an electronic copy for uh, everyone in our congregation. I'll also be printing off a hard copy for those who would like it. If you haven't yet responded to my email sent out yesterday, please, um, yesterday was a Friday, was it? Um, please let me know whether you'd like a hard copy. I've got them printed off here. Uh, we will sort out how to distribute them. If you'd like to come pick it up, that's great. Let us know. But... Um, you know, Brian and Judy Cullen will help us sort out, get that distributed to everyone in our church. Um, second announcement is uh, is these. I'll also be sending out to you an email uh, with these cards on it. Um, they're called viral kindness cards. Uh, the idea is um, you you put your if there's got so, there's someone in your street that you know, you might be elderly or vulnerable or lonely, um, or maybe you just want to you know, reach out to your neighbours. Then what you can do is, is um, uh, get a copy of one of these cards, fill it out. Uh, it just lets them know. It says, I live in the area and I'm also a member of Sam of Samuel Presbyterian Church. If you're self-isolating, I can help you uh, for free, of course, by doing uh, pick, pick, pick things there that you might be prepared to do for one of your neighbours. Uh, go and give it to them or drop it in, the, in, their, uh, in their letterbox. Uh, it's just a way for us to keep well connected to our, our, our neighbourhood. Uh, and uh, lastly, don't forget to uh, you know do it, carry out a, like a virtual morning tea. So after our service this morning, it will be absolutely fantastic if you could jump, uh, you know, grab the church photo directory, jump on the phone, uh, give give one or two or three people maybe a call, and just touch base and see and see how they might be travelling. Uh, okay, that's our announcements for this morning. Um, next is um, our, our what's God doing spot. It's funny, actually, isn't it? In, in, in so much of the news has been dominated by COVID nineteen and 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 the uh, the restrictions and what are the rule, current rules and what are we doing to stop the spread. Uh, in the meantime, there's been a, an awful um, cyclone go through Vanuatu, Cyclone Harold. Now, um, our Presbyterian Church has been very involved in um, a number of, in the church, the Presbyterian Church in Vanuatu, but particularly one of the Bible colleges there called um, 
you know, Brian and Judy helped me pronounce this the other day, Talao, Talua, Talao, I can't pronounce it. But look, we're going to show you a video that tells you about uh, what's happened with the with the Bible College there. It's been decimated by the cyclone. It's a peer for help for those who might be able to help. Uh, let me play the video now. The devastation from Cyclone Harold is absolutely horrific. It looks as though 30 years of ministry at Talua has just been blown away. But the reality is that the ministry of Talua, of training leaders for Christian churches in Vanuatu, will continue. Sometimes we think, wouldn't it be great if all that was required for world mission was just to throw some money in their direction? Well, this time it is that easy. Talua will rebuild. Talua will continue its vital ministry. But they'll get up and running a whole lot quicker if we can be generous with our donations to the appeal from APWM. So please, be generous. Be generous with your finances. Be generous with your prayers, particularly as at the moment we pray for the principal, for the staff and for the students of this very important college in the life of the church in Vanuatu as they seek to rebuild from the devastation that was Cyclone Harold. Okay, so it's now time for us to pray for uh, offering. I want to thank you very much for those who have um, switched their giving to online. And I know there are others out there also who are putting their offering aside uh, and will be bringing it in, um, you know, banking it when, when, when possible. I really want to thank you for that. Uh, we're so encouraged by the way in which, which, which you continue to support the work of our church here. Uh, but look, let me, uh, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that... Um, Giving is another way in which we express our trust uh, and our reliance on you. I want to give you thanks that even at a, at a trying time like this, it's an opportunity for us to keep declaring uh, the fact that we believe that you are the giver of all things. Uh, Father God, for what's been collected electronically, what's been set aside uh, during the week, we want to thank you uh, for that. We want to pray, Lord, that you would help us to use all of our resources for the purpose of building your kingdom and spreading the not just the good, but the best news there possibly is that Jesus uh, wants us to be a part of his family, that through him we can know, uh, know a position of forgiveness and, and redemption and reconciliation with God. May what's been collected during the week, and may what, we, what we've kept in our, our bank balances, our purses and our wallets, may it be used to further your kingdom in Jesus' name. Well, it's now time for us to um, uh, spend more time in, in prayer, in thanks and requests, and I'll hand over to John. Good morning, everyone. It's um, good to be with you this morning in worship. And uh, I invite you to be with me now as, um, and join with me as I lead you in a prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, it's with awe and wonder that we down bow, bow down before you, acknowledging you as our maker, our redeemer and our friend. We praise you for the wonderful works of your creation, for the provision for our every need and for your ever-present help in whatever circumstances that we find ourselves. Moreover, Father, we praise you that you are merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
and we thank you for that love which was demonstrated in the life and um, death of your son Jesus Christ as he gave his life on the cross to pay for the punishment that we deserved. And we praise you that in raising him from death you have given to us a living hope of eternal life. We are grateful too for the gift of your Holy Spirit to be our guide, our comfort, our counsel, our teacher and our strength as we live and work and witness for you in the world today. Lord God, we thank you for, for the gift and the privilege of being able to converse with you as children to a father. And so we bring our concerns to you as we pray for the folk who are in particular need at this time. For, for, for Diane Robinson, who will be having surgery tomorrow on her foot. We pray that that will be successful. For Neil Hewitt, Kevin Walker and Rob Smale and John Sweet, who've experienced surgery in recent days, weeks, we pray for complete healing. For Margaret um, Taylor and others who are struggling with ongoing pain, we ask that you'll grant them relief and comfort. For Julie Thompson in her time in care in Warwick, we pray for peace and comfort. We pray for Judy Pigeon and we give thanks that the present treatment has been successful in reducing the cancer in her body and we pray that she will continue to improve. And Lord, we give thanks that John and Barbara Tapscott's grandson has found new accommodation which has relieved the pressure for Barb and John. And we pray that, that Peter will seek your help in over, overcoming uh, his problems. We pray also for John as he sees his um, on, uh, cardiologist this week um, concerning some health issues. Loving God, into your care we commend those who are grieving the death of a loved one. For John and his sweet and his family in the loss of Margaret. And for Catherine Reddens on the passing of her granddaughter, grandfather. We remember too those who have lost one, loved ones through the corona um, virus epidemic. And we thank you for those. Um, thank you for those who are dedicated to the task of giving medical care and healing, and for those who work in laboratories, the scientists and other workers. And we thank you for their commitment to the work of healing. And we pray, Lord, that um, this um, virus. Uh, will decline week by week. And we pray too that a vaccine will soon be uh, discovered to conquer this virus. To your wisdom and guidance, Lord, we commend our Prime Minister and the National Cabinet as they continue to monitor, plan and resolve the difficulties that have arisen from this pan pandemic. We pray also for our local council whom you have appointed to guide and lead us through these challenging times. May they acknowledge the need for your wisdom and guidance in decision making and in carrying out their responsibilities. Heavenly Father, we remember before you Alex and Tracy Banks and their involvement in ministry in Korea. We pray for the leaders in the Hangong congregation as they continue to provide care for the physical and the spiritual needs of students and maintain their 
ministry and mission support. As you provided for the needs of Daniel and his friends in their time of captivity, we ask that you provide the finances needed for this vital ministry. And Heavenly Father, we pray for each other. We miss our times of corporate worship and one another's company. We pray for our minister, Peter, and we uphold him before you and pray for his physical and spiritual well-being in the face of the challenges confronting him at this particular time. Take from him all anxiety and stress and help him to trust you implicitly day by day. We pray also for the elders and others who are seeking to maintain contact with members and offer encouragement and support. Help us all, Lord, to, to live each day trusting in your guidance and strength and rejoicing in your unfailing love for us. Lord God, there's one more thing we ask. You know that we are in desperate need in this part of the country for deep, soaking rain to replenish the dry earth and fill our dams and enable farmers to plant and grow crops. We acknowledge our dependence upon you for all things. So be pleased to hear our cry and grant this request and to you we will give thanks and praise. And Father, these are our prayers and the silent prayers of each one of us. We offer in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory and honour and praise, now and for evermore. Amen. Uh, okay, so now we are going to sing another song. It's called Before the Throne of God Above. Um, we'll let you uh, sing, along, sing along with Katie, um, Before the Throne of God Above. time to grab your Bible and have it open. Uh, we're starting our Daniel series today, like I said earlier in the service. 
Uh, and um, we're going to be reading quite large chunks of Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a very interesting book. Uh, I really recommend for you to uh, jump online and check out the, both the book intro and the series intro. There will be links uh, on our website. Um, plus, for those in our church here, I've sent you an email with links to those. Uh, I really encourage you to have your Bible open and read along. Our Bible reading today is from Daniel 1. I want to thanks, big thanks to Rebecca for recording this for us. Today's reading is from Daniel chapter 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the, pa the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchen, kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter royal service. Daniel... Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach and Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, it's now time to, for our, our first Bible talk in the series on Daniel 1. I'll hand you over to um, Brad Jusen, the minister at Gundalini. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I want us to take stock for a moment uh, just about what COVID-19 has cost us. I want us to just take a moment to think about that, uh, the ways in which it has affected us. Now I get it, we are country people, we don't really 
uh, like to complain about things. We know there's always someone worse off than us. So we just like to get on with it. But I do want us to be able to think for a moment uh, and grieve for a moment just what this has meant. So maybe for you it has uh, cost your business a little, maybe it's affected your work. Uh, I reckon it's definitely affected your freedoms. Uh, I think it has probably affected your social life. Uh, maybe you're at school and it's affecting your schooling. Maybe it's your rhythms and routines and that's just getting under your skin. No matter what it is, I think we are a people who are affected at the moment and it does grieve us in those ways. Uh, I think at the moment it's good for us to be able to think about that because it allows us to think about who we are when the bottom falls out of things. It allows us to see a truer self, a truer picture of us when the chips are down. Uh, the passage we're going to be looking at today is about a group of people who are facing that question. Who are we when everything falls apart? Uh, what's it like for us when it all goes south? So when we put this series together, one of the big themes that we were seeing throughout the book of Daniel that is being dealt with is uh, just the, the fear uh, inducing world that we live in, the volatility of the world. When we put this together back in November 2019, little did we know just how volatile the world uh, is or was at that stage. Uh, and while that is a theme uh, that the world can be tipped upside down, the two things that we did want to highlight uh, as we're seeing this throughout the uh, book of Daniel. So as Dave and Pete and I read and prayed and studied through the book of Daniel, we wanted to uh, highlight, we, wanted to, we saw more and more this theme of the apparentness of all of these things. That while it seemed or it was apparent that the world was getting tipped upside down, God was still in control. And so we're convinced more and more though that it wasn't just a book about God being in control despite the apparentness of the world, but also that it was a wisdom book, a book about living wisely in a world uh, that is apparently hostile and volatile. Uh, our way of living wisely when it seems like all hope is gone, but it's not. And so the book of Daniel is a book about seeing clearly, seeing uh, from the right angle, seeing our fears, seeing uh, the apparentness of our circumstances, seeing that our God is in control, seeing that uh, we can be wise and live wisely, seeing the victory of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so let's dive into this passage. We're going to look at it in three parts. We're going to look at Daniel and his exile mates uh, given over. We're going to look at them given opportunity and we're going to look at them given position. Let's have a look at that together now. And so for Daniel and his friends, uh, they are given over. They are on the losing team. Uh, the book of Daniel, it starts really matter of fact, verses 1 and 2. It sets the scene. Uh, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord delivers Jehoiakim and the Israelites of that time over into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. They get to sack the temple. They take all of the valuable stuff, the God stuff. They take it away, cart it back to Babylon and put it in their own God's temple. Uh, and so, of course, it's not just, the peop uh, not just the stuff that's taken. He also takes some people. He takes the brightest and the best young men with him and takes them back. And this is part of a policy. Uh, you could just destroy everything as an invading army or you could take the people and make them into Babylonians. Uh, why leave uh, the Israelite legacy when you can instead take them and make them a product of Babylon? That's exactly what's going on here. It's part of this identity transplant that's going on. Why just win on the battlefield when you can actually conquer the next generation and make those Israelites into Babylonians? And so while I said the beginning of Daniel is matter of fact, you also need to, as we get to read about Daniel and his friends, you just hear how emotional this is. You get to see these young men and the great loss that they feel at the time. And so they are young men. They're probably teens as they're carted away and they lose everything. They lose their place. Uh, they Jerusalem, they watch their capital city get sacked and overrun. Uh, you know what it's like. It's not just their place, it's their home. Many of you have left your home uh, without wanting to. 
They're stripped from their family and their natural support structures. They are alone, never to see their family again, probably. And they're stripped of their value. Remember, this is political exploitation. They are pawns in this whole thing. You might read in verse 4 that they get a glowing description of who they are. But remember, any self-respecting Jew would rather die on the battlefield than be carted off to Babylon to become one of them. No one wants to be siphoned off to go and become one of the enemy. Uh, verse 7, it gets worse than that for them. They receive new names. These are the names their parents gave them. They're their family names. All of that identity is erased. Their identity, everything that makes them them, is getting stripped away. And the name change makes them sound a little more Babylonian, of course. Uh, but more than that, their names contained in them uh, a religious identity. Uh, they're linked to Yahweh, their God. So the El parts of Daniel and Mishael, the Yah parts of Hananiah and Azariah, they're the names of God woven into their very names. And of course, they're replaced by the pagan gods of the Babylonians at that time of Bel, Marduk and Nebo. Every time these boys are summoned, uh, they're reminded that they're not in Kansas anymore. And of course, this is their spiritual identity as well. This is their God attempting, apparently, ripped from them as they go to Babylon. Uh, we might be uh, familiar with lots and lots of movies that deal with uh, identity, mistaken identity, stolen identity, obscured identity. North by Northwest, uh, Unknown with Liam Neeson, even the Three Amigos are all stories about mistaken identity. And then there's, throughout these stories, a pursuit of true identity uh, to be able to express who those people truly are or to recover the thing that is most valuable to them, their very selves. And in a way, it's kind of our story as well, isn't it? Uh, who are we deep down? Uh, when the bottom falls out, as I asked before, when all of that is peeled away, who are we? And uh, more than that, even if everything hasn't been peeled away, who are we? Do we receive our identity in Christ or do we just receive it from the kingdoms that are around us? And that's what we see next for our boys in exile. And so Daniel and the boys in exile are given an opportunity. They change the one thing they can. Uh, they swap out eating uh, the food dished up to them by the Babylonians, the rich food, for veggies and water. Uh, now, you might have heard a bit about this diet and uh, you think that if you uh, undertake this, you'll end up looking far more healthy and better than everyone else. Veggies are good for you, but that's not exactly what's going on here. See, what is actually happening is that food given to them was probably more likely uh, to have been sacrificed to the gods of Babylon. And so what they're doing is they're pushing back on that culture of uh, of worshipping the other gods. That food had a religious taste. And so the boys in uh, exile, they're doing that, pushing back on that. Uh, and the thing is, though, while they do that and they make that resolution, there is more to the story than that. If you see in verse 9, we also see it's not just that uh, Daniel and his friends are at work here. It's also God at work during this time. So verse 9, we're told that it's not just that they are being faithful. God is doing something too. God caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel. So Daniel's mind uh, is on board with that as well. He's a little reluctant, but God is at work in that. And so God is in this. This is the big surprise here in chapter 1. God is right there with them in exile. Uh, right there in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, right there uh, giving favour among the minders, right there in the kitchen of Babylon. And so, yes, God gave Jerusalem over to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, yes, the people were scattered, but the big surprise is that God's not given up on them. They are uh, looked after. There is a door of hope, a jar for them to push on. Uh, Daniel is able to be God-honouring in this instance. And so are you seeing the wisdom in this? Daniel and his friends are actually uh, doing something here, but they're actually pushing on a door that God has left ajar and given to them. He's carrying out his actions in Babylon in step with what God's doing. 
there's kind of a harmony between what Daniel's doing and what God's doing right there. His actions are good and right, but there's also an attentiveness to what God's up to in Babylon too. And so that brings us to the third point. Uh, let's be clear on what God gives them. They are given position in this, God-given position. So it's not just that they are able to eat the veggies and the water, resist uh, the food, uh, keep a clear, clear conscience, as it were. It's actually more than this. They are given something else in this space. Uh, yes, it does keep their conscience clear, but God is actually wanting them to excel in this part. They top the class, we read, the Babylonian class. The Jewish boys are better than the Babylonians in the Babylonian school of magic, uh, visions and dreams. So verse 17, it says, To these four young men God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds, which makes sense. God knows about all of those things. Verse 20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. These blokes are going to end up being the top of the faculty of the dark arts department of Babylon. Uh, God gives them the grace not only to reject the food sacrificed to idols at that time, God's actually giving them the grace to be immersed in a culture, and not only immerse, but excel in it as well, in a very, very pagan place. Uh, Jared Manley Hopkins, in his uh, poem, one of the lines in his poem is that Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. This is the last place we'd expect God to turn up. This is the last place we'd expect God's people to be. And yet here they are. It might seem like a compromise, it might seem like they've sold out. Uh, maybe you think they should have resisted this and just died as martyrs. Maybe you'd suggest, yes, they join in, but make sure it's from up the back with your arms folded, frowning in quiet resistance to what the pagans are up to here. But don't miss what God is up to. Don't miss the great reversal here that God is doing in placing his men right there in this kingdom. Don't miss the apparentness of it that there's something else here. It appears that all God's promises are dead and now in Babylon, but God's actually lively at work right there in Babylon. It appears God's people are feeble and impotent and made powerless, but they're actually the most healthy. It appears that they were commandeered to build Babylon's kingdom, yet God is, God is subverting Babylon's kingdom for his own by placing his men at the very top. Daniel's going to live for a very long time. He's going to serve at the top for a very long time. He's going to see kings come and kingdoms go. And his very presence is a statement saying, you are all temporary, but my God prevails. And what's interesting is that's our God. Uh, he is the one who prevails. That's the work of Jesus, isn't it? He is the God who turns up in all of the wrong places. God in a manger the righteous one hanging out with uh, sinners. Uh, he is the God who dies on a cross, a king in a tomb. Uh, and yet, of course, death and Satan and Rome and the religious leaders, it looks like they chalk up a win on Good Friday. But, of course, that's not the way it goes. Yet, Jesus was right where he was meant to be, placed on the cross for our punishment, placed as a sacrificial lamb to take our guilt, placed on a, in, a, um, in a grave to take our death, placed apart from God to take our curse. He is the God in all of those places. And now, of course, placed on the throne to rule and to reign. And so as we get that picture of God at work in these things, I guess a couple of questions are, are for us in that. The first one being, are you living uh, that way with your eyes on Jesus? Or is the apparentness of the world around you pressing in too much? Or do you live with the reality that Jesus is indeed the King who died for you? And the second question for us who are following after Jesus is about the wisdom that we express. Are we following him wisely? Are we uh, following after him, seeing the doors that he is leaving ajar? 
I actually think there's probably two ways in which we uh, can get this wrong, probably many ways in which we can get this wrong, but at least two. One is that uh, maybe, maybe you stand for nothing. Uh, maybe it's as though if Daniel in an alternate universe, rather than taking a stand, making his resolution, imagine he just went with the flow. You know, we've been conquered, let's just become Babylonians. Maybe that's some of the way that you live. I'm sure there were Israelites that went to Babylon that probably did choose that way. Uh, it's kind of the slippers and tracksuit pants of the Christian life. It's just too much for us. We just go with the flow. We just eat what we're given. We consume what is placed in front of us. And we do become consumers, don't we? I think that is one of the real temptations for us, that we just go, it's too hard. I just want to give in. Uh, part of the issue is we fear. We fear that God is not with us. We fear that he's not placing us in the right place. We fear that he is not working things out for our best. And so we just give up. We just consume. Uh, what actually is necessary for us is to take a stand. I wonder what ideas you just have consumed, you just take on board, either from your family or the media or your friends or your desires that just lead you down this path to slippers and tracksuit Christianity, where you just don't do anything, where you don't uh, make a resolution or seek to live in accord with Jesus. And that's one side, and that is not uh, wise living. That's not building your life on the rock, as Jesus would call uh, a wise life being built. And so that's one side. The other side, of course, is that you take a stand on everything. Maybe that's what you do. Uh, rather than slippers and tracksuit pants, Christianity, maybe you are quadruple shot, caffeine, uh, get out of the way, God, I've got this. Maybe that's your brand of Christianity. Maybe that's your way of following. Uh, and in an alternate universe, it's as though Daniel staged a coup right there in Babylon trying to take over, rather than waiting to see what God was doing. And the funny thing is, it is still based on fear to push ahead like that, to push God out of the road, to kick down the doors, because it's fear that God's not looking after you. It's fear that he isn't quite placing you in the best place, and so you need to take that on yourself. It's fear that he is not doing what he should, or at least not quite to your standard, and you need to take over. And so that, maybe that is you pushing ahead. And again, that's not wise living. That's, that's foolish living. It is uh, foolishly reckless, always racing ahead of what God is doing. Maybe, maybe you're like that. Maybe you understand that. And so, of course, maybe you need to slow down. Wait on what Jesus is doing. Uh, seek after him and be able to live in step with him, pushing on the doors that he leaves ajar. And so here is my hope. Over the next nine weeks as we delve into uh, the book of Daniel, I'm hoping that this time in God's word becomes uh, the chlorine and flocculent for the well of our souls, making things cleaner and clearer for us. Uh, that it, things around us, the world would become a little clearer for us, the state of ourselves would become a little clearer, our identities clearer, that our fears would become a little clearer, the things that haunt us and cause us to run and hide would become more evident to us, uh, the things that stand in our way. Uh, one of the good things, there's not many, one of the good things about a Babylonian army that comes and conquers your city and kidnaps your young people is you know who is trying to wrestle your identity off you. For us, though, we don't have that luxury. We instead have kingdoms of careers, marketing, possessions, popularity, fame, family, tradition, false self. All of those things are the things that are seeking to conquer us. And so one of the blessings of COVID-19, of course, is that some of those things are taken away, or at least they are destabilised enough for us to be able to reframe our view. At very least, we've been given a bit more space to think and consider and reflect upon those kingdoms that, which seek to undermine who we are and stop us from living according to Christ's kingdom. And of course, I hope as us three churches undergo this journey, I hope the good news of Jesus becomes clearer as well for us. Uh, I hope that we have a quiet confidence 
that even when things seem hostile and volatile and threatening and crippling and depressing, we have a hope stored up for us in heaven that can't be shaken by any of those things. And more than that, we have a Saviour who is right here with us, even in exile. Our closing song for our service this morning is Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King. Let's sing together. our service to a close um, don't forget to ring someone after service um, to have a morning tea chat uh, let me close in prayer let me pray. Heavenly Father I do want to thank you for the way in which you call us to be your people that even um, even the Israelites being um, taken away so far away into a foreign land living in Babylon uh, even there they can live in such a strange place and in strange times as as your people Help us as we go our separate ways now to um, understand that we, uh, what we might live in strange and difficult times, but we are still called to be your people. Help us to be your mouthpiece. Help us to be your living witness in our community in ways that point people to the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior.
Stone.